Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's very special program, Music on Your Mind, The Power of Music to Educate and Heal Us. It features, honors, and celebrates the incomparable Marin Asla, oh, the Aspen Institute 2022 Harmon Eisner Artist in Residence. We are thrilled, Marin, to have you back on the Aspen stage. Thank you. And to recognize your work, not only here at Aspen, but indeed around the globe. Maura Marin and our other speakers in just a moment. I am Ruth Katz, Executive Director of the Institute's Health Medicine and Society Program, one of three Aspen programs co-hosting this event. HMS brings together influential groups of thought leaders, decision makers, and the informed public to consider health challenges facing the United States in the 21st century and to identify practical solutions for addressing them. Among the program's flagship initiatives is the NeuroArts Blueprint Project, a partnership between Aspen and the International Arts and Mind Lab of the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Its purpose is to cultivate the field of NeuroArts, which is the transdisciplinary study of how the arts and aesthetic experiences measurably impact the body, the brain and behavior, and how this knowledge is translated into practices that advance health and well being. This work, our work, is all captured in the project's groundbreaking report, Neural Arts Blueprint Advancing the Science of Arts, Health, and Well Being. And you'll hear a little bit more about the report in our conversation tonight. Aspen's arts program, under the direction of Erica Mallon and its Harmon Eisner Artists in Residence program, is also co sponsoring this evening's event. The Harmon Eisner program features artists such as Marin in inspirational and educational discussions rooted in arts and cultures across the Institute's various platforms. Erica was very instrumental in designing this evening's event. Unfortunately, however, she cannot be with us. She is back in New York recovering very nicely from her COVID diagnosis of just two days ago. She's, she's fine, I assure you. Our third co-host, of course, it's the Society of Fellows and its many members. Our thanks to Warren Sabin, Warren Sabin and his team for their partnership and support. Thanks as well to the staff of all three programs, especially Katya Wanzer and Raven Tucker of the Health Medicine Society team and, uh, Dan, uh, and to Danielle Bosan for her assistance all along the way. Finally, I wanna note that this program is being presented as part of the Michelle Smith Arts and Culture Series Michelle was an Aspen Institute trustee and lifelong supporter of the arts. Sadly, we lost Michelle back in 2022, but she left a great legacy, including this series for which we are most grateful. And now onto the program with some very brief introductions on the panelists before turning things over to our moderator, James Blue. First, of course, it is my great pleasure to introduce Marin Aslop, who actually needs no introduction. But just to remind you, Marin was the first woman to conduct a major US orchestra and has gone on to conduct most of the leading orchestras in this country and many of the most distinguished <coughs> European orchestras. She is the first and the only conductor to receive a MacArthur Genius Award. Marin has made history as well as the first woman to be appointed music director of a major American orchestra, the Baltimore Symphony. She is the founder of both Or Kids, which serves over a thousand high school students in Baltimore, and the Taki Aslop Fellowship that supports women conductors. In her spare time, Marin plays jazz violin with her band, Strong Fever. And the list of achievements, awards, and contributions go on and on, but in brief, I think you would all agree that Marin is a towering force, making the world a much better place in so many ways. Joining Marin is Susan Maxim. Susan, I'm sorry. You know, I tried. I tried. I tried. I explained to her that my name I was is say, I, We've been partners on a project for two years, and just tonight she told me for the first time I was mispronouncing her last name. <laughs> So Susan Mag Salmon, right? I said big fish. That's how there you go. <laughs> Founder and director of the International Arts and Mind Lab at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She is also co-director with me of the uh, Hopkins Aspen Neural Arts Blueprint Project. Susan's body of work lies at the intersection of brain sciences and the arts, 
and how our unique response to aesthetic experiences can amplify human potential. An entrepreneur and author, Susan's newest book, Your Brain on Art, will be released by Random House this spring, but I can assure you can, you can already order it on Amazon. I encourage you to go out and do so. Marin and Susan will be in conversation with our moderator, James Blue. James is an award-winning television and documentary producer and executive and owner and chief creative officer of Storyboard Pictures, a New York-based television production company. Previously, he headed the Smithsonian Channel and served as senior vice president of MTV News and documentaries within Paramount's Global's MTV Entertainment Group. James has won virtually every major award in journalism, including eight National Emmy Awards and the Walter Cronkite Award for Excellence in Television Political Journalism. James knows both our speakers and their work well, and so we couldn't be more delighted to have you moderating tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Now, mm -hmm. just... Oh, sorry. Uh, just give me one minute. One minute. Less than a minute. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes before I turn things over to James. We will be taping tonight's program. It will be available on various Aspen websites within a day or so. And finally, we are allowing time for questions at the end, about 15 minutes or so. We'll take as many of them as we can. With that, James, I will turn everything over to you. Thank you all for being here. It's going to be a great program. It is such a pleasure uh, to be on stage uh, with people that I already knew and that I can have a conversation with. I first met Marin, I think, um, when my husband and I moved to New York, and uh, I think I was uh, 21. Uh, and I met uh, Susan when I lived in Baltimore, and not as long, but certainly as deep. And so this is a really wonderful kind of coming together. Uh, I guess my first question really is to Marin, um, who is our resident artist and the um, Aspen resident artist uh, this year. And it's really just trying to get you to think and to share why you believe music is so critical to someone's health and wellness. And what is it that what is it about music that makes you believe this? I think like an easy question to start. Um, I think that I think that uh, you know if you if you think back, uh, I can't. Maybe they could put the microphone on. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. They, let me know if you can't hear it. Okay, because they're controlling the volume. Um, I think you know when you have a a child, you hear that the first word that they speak is usually not spoken it's usually sung mm -hmm. you know that somehow this idea that we're all born hot wired for music is really true and singing what do you do to, with your child the first things you do is sing to the child right you know or hum to the child and i think that there's something really uh it, it's just organic about music that is so important um, to us as human beings. And, you know, when someone comes to me and says, oh, no, I, I'm, I, I'm tone deaf. I say, well, whoever told you that really sold you a, a poor bill of goods because nobody's tone deaf. You know, everyone has this capacity. It's, it's just, you know, whether it's, whether it's nurtured or not. And music, I mean, I think we can all think of, you don't have to be a professional musician to think of a song that reminds you of a moment in your life, you know, or you hear, you hear a melody and it transports you somewhere. So music is really, I think it's just part of our human nature. And um, of course, I, I also think that music can capture emotional uh, responses, unlike words. And, and I find that so often that people will come up after a performance and say, you know, I, I've been struggling with this uh, loss or, or this way of thinking and, and this piece helped me. And music can change us in ways I think that, that words really cannot. Um, so, I mean, I'm not a scientist. This is not scientific at all. So maybe I'll turn it over to you. Um, but I, I do 
I do believe that music has a, a transformative power for all of us. So Susan, as someone who has worked in this field, you're a professional, what does music do to us? What does it do for our health? What does it do for our wellness? How does music impact us? Well, you know, I think when I think about music, um, I think about um, like- Shandor. Ah, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> better, better, better. Um, you know, you don't have to understand how the brain works to know that music is effective. I mean, we all know it. Ah, who's, who's on the microphone? All right, let me, let me move it up. Thank you. Better, 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 better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you don't have to know about brain science to know in your lives that music is so effective. Um, we feel it. We feel it in, in the songs that we love. Um, you know, I often think that rhythm is the first sound that you hear when you're in utero, right? You hear the heartbeat of your mother. So you're born into rhythm. And I, I love what you said about, you know, when, when children are little, the babbling that they do, the, the swaying, you know, there is just a natural way that we weren't learn language through rhythm. Um, we know a lot about the brain and music. It's really the most studied art form. And that's pretty extraordinary, right? It's really by far the most studied art form, music and sound. Um, and in, in large part over the last five years, NIH has done quite a bit of looking at how music and sound changes our brains and bodies. And what are the mechanisms involved in that? Um, music is also something that uh, is distributed. The way we process music is distributed across the entire brain. And that turns out to be evolutionarily and physiologically really important. Um, so if you have a stroke or if you have Alzheimer's, um, parts of the brain that are damaged may not be able to um, act, be activated with music, but other parts of the brain still hold those abilities to be able to create music and sound, whether you're the maker or the beholder. Um, and I think one other thing that's worth, um, um, I am tone deaf. Um, my no, husband, not. my husband, <laughs> Rick, Rick. <laughs> uh, one of the really interesting things about um, music and is that um, whether you're the maker or the beholder, you don't have to be good at it in order for it to have enormous physiological and neurological impact. And I think that's actually really a, a mythology that we think we have to know how to play an instrument or we have to be good at something for it to have real value. Of course, the better you are at it and the better you are when you're beholding music, I think the saliency of that is there, but it's, it's sort of extraordinary that um, music works with us and on us. It works with us and it works on us. And one of the things, Marin, I really am excited to really have you share and really tell us what was the goal and how did you get there? We heard, we heard that you've started Orchids Kids in Baltimore, but when you began talking about it, what did you want to accomplish and how did you want to get there? What did you want to do? Well, um, I started a program uh, when, I, when I moved to Baltimore, I was I was really once again struck by the lack of um, diversity in the orchestra. That the orchestra didn't look like the community it was it was serving, and I mean I'm always struck by that. But I was especially struck by it in Baltimore, um, and you know I started thinking, well, why aren't there more people of color on stage? And it's because you have to have access to learning an instrument very early to achieve this level of, of prowess. I mean, this is sort of goes to your point about specialization a little bit maybe, but I thought, well, why don't we just try to create access for all kids and see what happens? And um, so my first idea was to have every member of the orchestra mentor a kid in the neighborhood. and. And I also said, I, I think we should do it without compensation. Maybe that was the, the stumbling block. I'm not sure. But um, anyway, it, it started like that. But then, the, then you know, after talking to everybody um, and talking to people in the community, we finally found a school that would partner with us and give it a try. And so we had 30 first graders 
And um, we just went, you know, just sort of opened the back of the trunk of the car and had a few instruments and brought them in and started, really started working with these kids. And from those 30 first graders, um, we have uh, over 1800 kids now playing musical instruments. And of that first class, that was in 2008 that we started, of that first class of 30 kids, 11 of them continued to play all the way up through high school. And several of them are graduating from college now and several are music education majors and music performance majors. And I mean, I never dreamt that the first generation of kids would, would take to it like that, but many of them also want to start similar programs in other neighborhoods because it, it's not, it's about music, of course, but it became a, um, you know, I, I used to ask the kids, well, do any of the, are you ever hassled by other kids, you know, because you're, you play? No, they said, no, not at all. We hassle those kids saying, why are you out on the street fighting and stuff? You should be playing with us. You know, so it, it worked as a, um, in many ways, you know, as a as safety. And also, you know, these kids were able to really find themselves. You know, these are not kids that that have the same opportunities as we had as children. These are kids that really are struggling and to have an outlet for your emotions and that's healthy and also to be praised for what you're doing that and they they travel they, you know, they know the world now. They, it, it's just been amazing, and they're absolutely inspiring kids to be around. I love them. It, I, I'm, I live in Baltimore, and I, this program is extraordinary. I remember in 2008 when it first started, and just a couple of things about this: children choose their own instruments, right? They actually, yes. and that's a really important part that they figure out sort of what it is that. It meets them, the collaboration that happens with these kids, the creative problem solving, the sort of serve and return. There's all these amazing social and emotional benefits that happen with this program, which is extraordinary. And we also know that um, children get an opportunity to build stronger connections with their colleagues and with their educators and with their families. Um, and interestingly, as these young children now, as people have started to study ORCIDs and other programs that really Naren started around the country that really hit, hit that, that keynote to build these programs. It turns out that children that are playing have more synapses in their brains. They grow brain synapses. They also have more gray mat brain matter. They have better cognition. They have better self-regulation. They have better attention and focus, less anxiety, less stress. I mean, if there was one arts prescription that we could give the world, it would be to play music as young children. And this program does it so beautifully. So, I mean, it's, I, it really is an extraordinary program. And they get scared every time I say, come on, let's go for 10,000 kids now. I mean, wouldn't, <laughs> oh wouldn't that be amazing if, yeah. if on the news, Baltimore was known for the city of music, yeah. you know? <laughs> that would be something amazing to me. Yeah, um, it would be. And, you know, it's, it's just fascinating because um, when you speak about health and wellness, I, you know, this program also, a lot of the kids have um, some respiratory issues from growing up in, in, you know, with the lead paint and with this and all, all, all kinds of conditions. And um, so playing a wind instrument can really dramatically help you when you have asthma or allergies and things like this. And so the, several um, doctors in the area were astounded by the progress that these kids were making by playing the trumpet or by playing the saxophone. And so it's actually helped them health wise mm -hmm. too. And it's fun. Yeah, it's, it's fun. It is right? fun. And that's such an amazing thing too. And it's a, when you see a kid, you know, when you see a kid that's eight years old and you bring in a bunch of instruments and you say, you know, you just sort of watch them and you know, I'll never forget this one kid, Tyrone. He saw that bass, the double bass. And I mean, it was really like a brother he hadn't seen. And I mean, he ran to this double bass, like he was waiting for this double bass. Can you, you know, pick what, it up? 
No, of course not. He couldn't, <laughs> you know, but what kid runs to a double base? I was, and another one to the tuba. We have more tuba players. Uh, they're going to really, uh, it's unbelievable. Why? I have no idea. But, you know, something in them, it spoke to them. And uh, I was really keen with this program. I, my parents started me on the piano and I hated the piano. And I was, ter- I, my mother says I was genius, but uh, I, I think I was terrible. I just didn't like the piano. So this was really important. And then I switched to violin when I was about six or seven. And my my experience was completely different because violin was my instrument. And so I was really keen that these kids be able to pick their own instrument and not get stuck like I did. (laughs) So Susan, can you talk a little bit about what the experience of being in a band like Orc Kids and having that music education and having that sort of music uh, opportunity, what does that do for kids? You said it creates more synapses. But in terms of the trajectory, how does that put kids on a better sort of health and wellness track? So there's a researcher at University College London named Daisy Fancourt, and she's done some interesting epidemiology work around outcomes. So looking at data over 50 years of data in, in, in the UK case, and now she's doing some work with um, the National Endowments for the Arts as a research lab to look at this in the United States. And one of the things that they find is that kids that that play music or, or that are doing different types of music and other arts actually make better decisions, make better life decisions. Um, they have the ability to be able to self-regulate and to be able to, to figure out how they um, are in relationship to others. And so there are these amazing natural abilities that are, are built through these, these, um, these cognitive skills of playing music, but also playing with others. Um, Yo-Yo Ma, you all may know a program that he does called Silk Road. Mm -hmm. Um, And Silk Road is an opportunity to really bring people from other countries together playing um, and oftentimes native instruments. And so again, learning about culture, language, um, all of the ways that you can get to know the world. So there's a real interesting opportunity there in terms of how do we get to know each other and how do we really communicate on a nonverbal level? And I think, as Marin said, sound and music are so um, ancient and um, in many ways are so part of our DNA that we can say things to each other that we never could find words for. And I think there's something about the humanity of that. Um, you know, often we get so transactional and music is so transcendent mm. that there's really an ability to go beyond what we might be able to do if we're just trying to explain ourselves. I mean, one of the things that I was really struck by, Susan, when we were preparing for the panel, you said something that was very, very uh, just amazing, that this is a new field of medicine and this is a new sort of area of medicine. And can you talk about that sort of evolution and sort of what both is the opportunity and sort of what has sort of gotten us here that this now is a critical place where you can call it a field? So, you know, over the last 20 years, um, technology has really created amazing non-invasive tools to get inside our heads and get inside of us. And that has really allowed for uh, us to understand this role of the arts and music specifically, but the role of the arts in our health and well-being. So we know a lot more than we ever had about how the arts change our brains and bodies. Um, We also have, have seen that Um, as complementary or integrative health, music and the arts have been very supportive really from the beginning of time. Uh, We now can understand more about dose and dosage. We can understand a little bit more about mechanisms and about what are the neurobiological things that are happening within our brains. Um, There are so many intractable problems that medicine alone cannot address. And one of the things that we see with the arts is that we're able to bring them together to look at things um, like stress, anxiety, depression. We're looking at gait and using things like algorithms on shoes to be able to change rhythm. Um, There's a company called MetaRhythms that just became, um, had a breakthrough FDA award so that they were able to put sensors on shoes to help people change their gait when they've had a stroke or when they've had Parkinson's disease. 
there's a number of amazing innovations that are happening with technology, but also understanding how the arts work. So this field of neuro arts or neuro aesthetics is really emerging. Um, and I think just a couple of other things is that it's interdisciplinary, the idea of bringing public health together with medicine and neurology and neuroscience and the arts. You know, the artists have always known that the arts are effective, but we have not been able to bring that knowledge through as traditional uh, medicine or public health. So it's really an exciting, really emerging field that's growing. And, and what does that, uh, what's the opportunity of it now being designated as a field? What now becomes possible? So I think there's a couple things that become possible. One is more research and more research dollars to really understand that education, being able to train people to be practitioners in the field. That's really important. Mm -hmm. um, really bringing new people into the field, building policy. So there's very little policy that allows us to have healthcare providers pay for the arts. That's really an important aspect, whether that's in healthcare or frankly in education. You know, we're just seeing, it's interesting to see California last night bring arts back into the schools. That was really a, a major win, major win. That's, it's been going the, the other way. Also looking at sustainable funding and sustainable models so that the arts are part of mainstream medicine and mainstream health and education. So there's a real opportunity to really make this something that is really we, uh, woven throughout all of the areas of our lives. Making it sustainable, making it work over the years. Marin, can you just talk a little bit about you're having success, people know ORCID's work, do you want to get to 10,000? What's the impediment? Oh, it's always money. And sadly, <laughs> I mean, sadly, it's a, it, seems, it seems like a, um, a poor excuse to me, um, but it's always money, uh, I would say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I think I'm a, I'm a great believer that, you know, there's, you don't need that much money, you know, but you do need enough. I think, so, I see a lot of programs that have too much money. Um, not, not, none of them that I'm involved <laughs> in, but, um, but, you know, I wish, um, I wish that we could have leadership that would value that would value um, human creativity in a way that would support it and um, and set an example for everyone to to invest in human creativity because. We sure, sure need a lot of creativity at the moment, don't we? I mean, we're going to need a lot of creativity to figure out um, the next few steps in our future as a human race. And uh, I, I think that it's, it's really underestimated. And, and I'm and not being a scientist, I'm, I can't measure it. Uh, but I, I see that when a child learns an instrument, I mean, they don't have to become a musician. But the skills that they they take away from that are applicable across every single discipline. You know, the the idea of I mean, just just having a work ethic, developing that, you know, to play an instrument, you have to motivate yourself to practice every day. And when you don't, you don't improve, you know, and that idea that this kind of investment and you have to do it yourself. And I know that when IBM started um, their company, they hired musicians because they were the ones that could self-motivate enough and really be present. And I see that in the kids, you know, that they know they understand this. And also they work together playing in ensembles. So they have um, the skill of conflict resolution, you know, because they learn to listen to each other. They know when to, okay, it's not my turn. They know when to step out and take a solo. You know, all these things, and some of them are, are not really quantifiable, but you really see incredible growth in the human being. So it's not, I, I just, I feel that we live in a world that's overly specialized and so segmented, you know, and not interconnected enough. But, I, and I think art can do that. It can connect us in that way. You know, the World Bank recently um, uh, was spoke to some of this and 
said that arts and culture are essential foundations for economies to grow and thrive. So if you don't have arts and culture, you can't have true healing, you can't have great health and well-being, and you really can't meet your fullest potential. And I think for the World Bank to say that is a really important statement. Pretty shocking. Shocking, <laughs> right, shocking, right. Uh, I guess, but they might have the money I need. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's, right. that's a door you should knock on for sure. Well, and it's interesting because while it doesn't may not take a lot of money, I think the fact that it's always asking artists often to volunteer for their time or to put their time out as opposed to paying for for that right. work, I think is right. also super um, important. Like, what do we pay for what we value, and I think there's a question of how do we value this in our culture that still is, is yet to be really elevated. Mm. That's a good point. Yeah. One of the things that I, I found interesting about the conversation, specifically Marin, as you've talked about the young people, who you are teaching, okay, here's an instrument, go learn it, go do all the things that you do with it. Um, I guess what surprised you about the curriculum and the, sort of the, the way you thought we gotta do it this way? What surprised you in implementing that and how have you changed based on what you learned through the experience of, with the kids? Well, I, I, think, I think everything was a surprise in a way. The teaching music was the easiest part. That was the surprise. The, the hardest part was trying to help the kids navigate life. Um, you know, we realized early on that a lot of them hadn't eaten anything proper. And so we then we got a wonderful organic food company that brought meals for the kids every day and whatever was left over, we would leave um, uh, out front so the families could take it home. Then we realized, okay, they don't have access to, um, to you know, they don't have really the resources to do their homework properly. So then we, you know, so what we tried to do was see what, take our cues from the kids. You know, teaching the music was was almost the easiest part. The, but in terms of teaching the music, we also saw that that these kids were curious about the creative process, not just the recreating process. So the kids started composing. And so we started and we improvised. We have a jazz band, but also the, the classical kids um, improvise. And so it's a much more <clears throat> comprehensive music education than I got at Juilliard because they're actually creating, you know, it's shocking. So, and they said, you know, we, we love the classical music, but we want to play pop music too. And I'm, I'm all about it. I, I say, you know, there's two kinds of music like Duke Ellington, good music and bad music. Let's just play good music and I'm fine. So, you know, we we do some mashups of, you know, Beethoven and, you know, Beyonce, and that's okay for me. And maybe that, you know, everything that we've done has been um, really trying to react to what the kids want. And I think that there aren't many education educational models that, that have the luxury of being able to operate that way. Um, but, but we have been able to do that. So it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Susan, I wanna go as technical as you can go. Tell us when we hear music, what happens in the brain? And I know uh, you're not a neurologist, I, I, but I know you, Done a lot of work about this. You but might I, know a neurologist. You might know a neurologist or two. <laughs> uh, but but, I, but I, what I really want to know is just to share with the audience sort of what is the process? Like, what is it that gets turned on, excited, and actually activated when we hear music or when we play music? Because I think that is one of the things that is so exciting that you guys can now track all of this. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it starts with your ears, right? It starts with your ears. And I think that's all that's really important to remember, right? So the way that we hear is um, is very different than our other sensory systems. And so hearing is one of the few senses besides smell that goes directly to your limbic system. 
So, mm. you know, it goes directly to that primal part of your brain that is all about emotion, all about feeling. And so it's not being processed and analog, it's not analytical, it is true feeling. Um, we also are vibrational beings, right? Everything is vibration. And so music moves through us and in us. And so the ability for these vibrations, whatever they are, whether it's Beyonce or Bach, to be able to have these vibrations move you and move you at a very primal level, I think is part of what happens with, with the way that music affects us so immediately. And, you know, Marin mentioned this idea that, you know, music, three notes can transport you back to when you were 10 years old. Um, it can, it can, it's, it's a time machine. And I think in part because of the way the brain holds that different types of information, um, it, it holds those, those sounds and encodes those memories in a way that allows you to call them back very, very quickly. So. No, that's very, very helpful. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions. I have one or two more for the close, uh, but I would love to get questions questions uh, versus statements. Uh, I, I'm sure many of you are musicians. I'm sure many of you play a number of instruments. You don't need to learn about that tonight. <laughs> but we are interested in your questions. Are there questions? Hi, thank you for a wonderful conversation. My name is Cindy Pasca. Um, just out of curiosity, what have you seen as far as educational budget increases for some of the programs, the music programs, the other arts programs, based on the program you've developed, Marin, and the work that you're doing, uh, Susan? Well, I'll just say that one of the um, <coughs> real goals of the Neural Arts Blueprint is to increase budgets, and budgets have been going in the wrong direction. Um, they've been very, very um, limited. Um, you know, we were talking about creativity and thinking about sort of just the way that music helps to enhance brain uh, growth. And that's not taken into account when we're looking at budgets for schools at all. And I think that maybe is sort of the next phase when you're thinking about the Department of Education, the Department of Health, really thinking more deeply about how the arts can really help in brain development and in brain capacity. And so, but budgets are, are really dire. I would, I would second that. The um, ORCIDS is all privately funded. Um, there, there's one aspect of it for the really little kids that um, is in school and some of the schools can cover it, but I mean, Baltimore City Public Schools, you know, I mean, there is no money. So, so it's all privately funded. And, and Marin, just to, to take it a bit further, and I think this goes to a little bit of what the questioner is wondering, have other people come to you and say, oh, I want to do this, how did you do it? And what has that conversation been like? And has it replicated in any way? Because um, it's just interesting, because you have had success. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, a lot of people studied this idea for many years, and we just, you know, started doing it. And uh, so people were, I think a lot of people were amazed that we could get this program going. So um, I would say that ORCID is probably the most generous program in terms of um, sharing information. I mean, our goal is not to be the only one, but to, to, and each community is a little bit different. So there are constantly people coming to observe and, and to talk to ORCIDs. Um, you know, I had an idea that or maybe we could sort of franchise it and, and build it out, but you know, I'm no longer music director in Baltimore, so I can't keep pushing. I can only keep pushing for them to um, do what they can do. And uh, instead of, you know, <laughs> being Herculean in my efforts, I can only be a little bit, a little bit distanced. But there's been a lot of, um, a lot of programs have emulated it. Um, but ORCIDs, for some reason, maybe because I'm like a dog with a bone, you know, I just won't give up. Um, ORCID seems to have really stuck. Yeah. Another question? Yes. They're bringing a microphone for it, please. Is it just... It's on, thank you. 
Um, how had you ha how did you handle the growth? I am assuming that if you started with 21st graders, that that not all of them wanted to continue, and many did. Did you take it through the um, first six grades of public school? Did you uh, did you then bring it on to junior high and high? Did you stick with these kids through their education? Yeah. So um, actually, the first school that we started with with 30 there were 30 first graders. Um, the first school closed after the first year we were there. So we had to find another school. And that was, you know, just, you know, crazy. And we found um, a school called Lockerman Bundy in West Baltimore. And uh, we walked in and it was filled with murals and color. And I thought, okay, this is great. And the, the great thing is the principal wanted the, there are not many principals that want this also in their school. So we moved over there and the school was much bigger and had wider access. And then we started putting different schools together in sort of a nucleus of uh, you know one group. And so we have um, in West Baltimore, I think nine schools. And then we opened uh, a hub in East Baltimore as well and have a similar number of schools there. And then those schools, get together. So, you know, it's just kind of connecting all these folks. But I should say this is not an in-school program. It's an after-school program. So it's from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. every day. And what's important is that it's also free childcare for, for all the parents. And that was something that was needed as well. So that's why it is. Part of it is in school because we have re re not replaced, but I think um, so supplement, well, yes, supplemented, and in some cases, they never had it, um, uh, the music education in the school, but it's not under the school system. Um, so that's what's happening. And then um, the school system came and said, you know, we have a school, I um, uh, can't remember exactly where it is now, but it was in a pretty rough neighborhood, and it was one of the most challenging schools around, they said, why don't you take that for, um, and that was a junior high and high school. And that's where we started the jazz band because string instruments are much harder. You have to start much younger. So we thought, and, and that's, that's worked out really well too. And, um, but the program ends of course, when the kids leave school, but what we try to encourage and what's happened naturally is that most of the kids come back and teach the younger kids so that we want to try to keep this cycle of mentoring. You know, the idea is that as soon as you learn something, you need to teach it to someone else. And most of these kids just kept coming back. And it's, of course, in their neighborhood, too. So even though we didn't have any high schools, I had hoped to, you know, maybe get a couple of high schools, too. But maybe in some ways it was better because they all come back to this program. So that's kind of the gist of it, although it's- and, and, and what it really does, it points to the advantage of doing something community and neighborhood based. Mm -hmm. And so if everyone had to commute downtown or commute mm -hmm. somewhere, it just wouldn't work. And- well, especially in Baltimore, yeah. there's no transportation. Yeah, so it's, it's just- well, And you made the point too, that food was really important for the kids, but also, if I remember correctly, there were certain times when there were performances where parents couldn't come because they were working, but then you worked around that and you were able to do performances in different times and oh, there yeah. was always I mean, food. It was crazy. The yeah. music really was the easy part. It was all yeah. the logistics and the, you know, and then of course COVID. And then, you know, a lot of these families don't have all these devices that we have, you know? So there'd be a kid in the car be having, going with the mom to work to, to do the violin lesson in the back of the car. I mean, this is what was going on on the Zoom. It was, it was really crazy, but ORCIDS was within 10 days, ORCIDS was all online. And they managed to you know, really try to be present for the kids. And I, I, think, I think that was the hardest thing for the kids, not being able to play together. For, for these times too. It's been a rough And it's really helpful for mental health for the kids too, to have that connectivity all the way through. Yeah, it's really made definitely. A difference. definitely. More questions? Yes. The lady there with glasses. 
Oh, they both have glasses. Okay, everybody's okay. got glasses. We'll, we'll do the, maybe on the front row and then the lady on the second row. I just have a quick question. You talked about good music and bad music. Is there any data that shows that bad music affects you in a negative way? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, people use music for torture, right? And so I think there That's is certainly point. bad music. Um, <laughs> and, and I think, you know, preference is really important. Cultural preference is really important. Um, so, you know, there is certainly data around that. And, you know, if you, you know, sensory overload can be a real thing. And so the ability to be able to have quiet time, I think is important, but, um, but I think, I think your point is really that people, any music is good music if you enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'd like to know, um, first of all, it's a wonderful program and congratulations for making it happen in a place like Baltimore. But I'd really like to know is um, after getting this musical experience and all the things that go along with your mental uh, ability, did anybody notice any, um, any difference in the children's grades? Yes. Did they say the grades improved or they, maybe they didn't want to study anymore? What happened with their education? <laughs> No, absolutely. There's there's a lot of data. I don't. I'm not up on the most current data since I'm I'm not with the symphony anymore. But the um, we, two things that really struck me. One was that the orchids in general, I think, um, attended almost two weeks more of school than their um, peers because they didn't want to miss orchids after school, and the grades. The grade levels were generally one, one letter grade above, okay. and so they really, it really did help. But another thing to say is that we have a contract with every child, and it says that you will always do your homework, and you know it says sort of all these things, and you know behave well, and these things, you know respect your parents. I mean, we try to put everything in. Eat your vegetables. This is not specific, but um, there's this, this a term in education called transfer, where skills from one domain transfer to another. And we know that music transfers to lots of other domain areas. Um, you probably heard math, but but it's not surprising that grade letters would go up and other things. would You would see positive results in other areas of your life. Thank I'm you. sure they have much more current data that's that's mm -hmm. uh, really interesting. But you know, just to collect data, just to give you an idea, I don't know the you know when we went to companies that do this kind of data collection, you know, we're talking two hundred fifty thousand dollars for the study, you know, or the and I I I mean I understand data is important and I want it, but I, I'm I can't spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars that I could spend on kids. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it, it's just a, it's a tough, um, tough road sometimes. The gentleman there behind you. There's been um, much publicity recently about the redesign of Geffen Hall at Lincoln Center. Could you describe a little bit the importance of concert halls, um, the acoustics, and most importantly, live music instead of listening on air earbuds? Yeah. And, and possibly in the context of helping young people understand and develop an ear. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, Geffen Hall. No, yeah, thanks. Geff, Geffen Hall. I, um, Deborah Border, who is responsible for having it, um, having this hall done, uh, um, offered me a tour a couple weeks ago when I was playing in Carnegie Hall, but I didn't have time, so. I'll, I'll conduct New York Bill in, in May, so I'll, I'll let you know how it is. But my um, my colleagues say it's really great. And I think not only does it sound well, but you know, it's the whole experience. It's the whole aesthetic experience of going of going to a beautiful place and and having a transformative experience. I think that's really important. Um, and and that it's comfortable and everyone feels welcome and there's a there's a sense of um, belonging, you know. Some halls are so um, austere and off-putting, and and um, Avery Fisher Hall was one of those halls, but I don't think it is any longer. Um, but you know what's so interesting is that I think the orchids 
they're more comfortable at the concert hall in Baltimore than I am. You know, they come in and they're, you know, they're just, hey, Mary, what's happening? <laughs> and um, they just really, uh, you know, because they grew up around it. And and they they go to concerts and they're much better behaved than the adults because they're really listening. They know what they're listening. I think part of the issue is that without, um, you know, we all, and we we're talking about that, we all react to music, okay. But then when you start to know about music, it has, it has more meaning. So you can really engage with it. And the, the less education we get, the less interest we have and the less engagement we have. I mean, I don't know much about art. When someone takes me through a museum and starts telling me about, I mean, it depends on the person too, but about the shadow and the light and how this, and you see that, oh, I didn't even notice that. You know, I start really getting into it. And I think that's important to have as well. So I think these kids, you know, it's something that people don't think about, but these kids are our future listeners as well as participants. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I... Yeah, I mean, also the importance of live music versus recording. Oh, I think that might be more to you, yeah? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, things are so contextual also. So I think it depends on the context that you're really thinking of <coughs> listening to music. Um, but live music and recorded music do enter your body sensorially in a different way. You know, the vibrations are different. So I don't know that one is more important than the other. But to your point about being in the space with a live performance, you know, that translates to me as an enriched environment where you are bringing in all kinds of sensorial experiences, maybe novelty or awe or surprise. You're watching someone physically. So there's a mirror neuron, there's a empathy and an engagement. And um, I think those kinds of experiences really do change us, change us physiologically, change us psychologically. So I think those are really important experiences to have. Um, and that's not to say that if you're listening to music and it's helping to regulate your breathing or helping you to be able to um, lower cortisol because you're listening to something that's calming you isn't equally as important. So again, I think it's contextual. And we don't teach sensory literacy in any schools or even as adults. So I don't think we know that the light really affects our circadian rhythm moment by moment, or that smell is olfactory systems are so, so memory inducing, or that live music versus recorded music. So I think the more we do know about how these aesthetic and arts experiences affect us, the more we can make better decisions about how we live more fully. And that's, to me, very exciting. And I think that's also hope. One for sure. We have time for two more questions, and why don't we start with the gentleman here, and we'll end with the lady there. Yes, uh, uh, you said that the funding is a problem, or, or that is the, uh, but I think if you can get the politicians uh, convinced, because we've got guns which are more than the population of the United States proliferating all over the country. We have weapons that our taxpayer pays to destroy people all over the world uh, in a massive way in every war, every time you turn around. We could have a music tax just like gas tax because some of our successful musicians, they are on drugs, they do all kinds of things, they make so much money. You could take a small portion of that and you could get enough funding that can probably make as many instruments available in this country as the population, just like we have guns. Or we could put a tax on guns <laughs> or music. <laughs> Just an idea. I have the I have the slogan for sure. Violence, <laughs> not violence. <laughs> Great slogan. Last question, please. Thank you. This question is for Susan. Um, you both talked about how uh, music and the arts are transformative rather than transactional. I think another way to put that is um, qualitative rather than quantitative. Given that, how do you know what questions to ask when using the tech to do research and gather data? Sorry, when using the 
the the new the advances in technology, oh, technology. Um, yeah. to to find out what kind of what kind of impact music has on the brain. How do you know what questions to ask? Well, how do you know what to look for? There are there is an army of researchers around the world that are studying different types of music. Um, and I think it's, you know, science, people don't think of science as necessarily being creative, but it's highly creative. And so we know there are scientists, um, I'll give a shout out to Charles Lim, who yeah. is at UCSF. He studies improvisation. And so what he's been able to understand, because he was a musician interested in the ear, he's an otolaryngologist. So his passion was trying to understand, and he's a jazz musician, loves jazz. So he wanted to understand what's happening in the brain when you're doing improv. And what he was able to do by creating a plastic, guitar, uh, sorry, plastic keyboard, keyboard um, having a musician play a rehearsed piece and an improv piece, what was turning on and turning off in the brain. So in this case, a part of the prefrontal cortex was shutting down to allow you to not self-regulate and to not be critical yeah, of cool. your work. Very cool. He's now translated that work with cartoonists, with spoken word, with, um, I believe, mime, I'm yeah. pretty sure. He's a creative guy who's doing rigorous science. Um, there are other folks that are really interested in the role of rhythm and gait, I mentioned earlier. So I think, you know, neuroscientists, neurologists, cognitive scientists, rehabilitation um, PH, MD, PhDs um, are really thinking about in their kind of um, perch on their, from their perch, what are they interested in studying? And, you know, I mentioned that NIH has begun to start to fund some work in large part due to Renee Fleming and Francis Collins really coming together, NEA, and there's some folks from NEA here today, head of research, Sunil Angar. Um, and what's been really amazing is that more researchers are starting to be able to get paid to study as opposed to a side gig in a garage sort of band and be able to look more carefully at what, how do we study these art forms like music? What are the standard protocols? What are the outcome measures so that we can build on each other's work? Because you know, research in some ways is very broad, but not very deep. And we need to be able to build like other scientific fields on the research of others. And so that work is really happening, it's growing, it's robust. Um, but I, I think we forget sometimes that scientists are really creative. Mm. Okay. Yeah, my pleasure. Great, thank you. Great. Baron and Susan. Yeah,